Hey folks, it's Holly here. Welcome back to my channel. And today I'm diving into a brand new 2025 study by Cummings and colleagues that compares heavy versus lightweight training in experienced lifters. Now, this isn't the first time researchers have asked this question. In fact, several studies have already looked at low versus high load resistance training in trained individuals. One of the most well-known examples you've probably heard about is the 2015 Schoenfeld study. It found that trained men built similar amounts of muscle whether they lifted heavy or light as long as each set was taken to failure. Where heavy training really stood out though it was in strength gains. Those were noticeably better with higher training loads. So what's different about this new paper? Well, most previous studies have compared low loads to more moderate loads, typically in that eight to 12 rep range. What hasn't been explored as much are training extremes. So true high load training, for example, three to five reps per set at around 90 to 95% of your one rep max versus very high rep, low load training. So that's closer to 20 to 25 reps per set. And that's exactly the gap this new study set out to fill. And what's really important here is that it was done in trained lifters, people with at least two years of consistent training experience. So the results actually apply to those who've already spent some serious time in the gym. So what was the purpose of this study? Well, the researchers wanted to compare adaptations to high load resistance training sets of three to five reps at about 90 to 95% of your one rep max with low load training, where participants did 20 to 25 reps at around 40 to 60% of their one rep max. Importantly, all sets were taken to failure, meaning participants kept going until they felt they couldn't perform another rep with proper form. Now, the research team looked not only at muscle size and strength, but also at muscle fiber cross-sectional area. They also looked at fiber type composition and a range of cellular markers like satellite cell content and myonuclear number. Now, their key question was whether these two very different loading schemes would produce different results in trained lifters. So let's take a look at the methods. What did the authors do? The study recruited 14 trained men and women with an average age of 26. Now, the participants were also required to have a history of strength training of at least two years with a primary goal of increasing muscle mass and strength. This included performing at least one session per week targeting the lower body. Now, the design was very clever. It was a within subject model where each participant trained one leg with high loads while the other with low loads. This way, factors like diet, sleep, and genetics didn't confound the results since both legs belonged to the same individual. Now, the intervention lasted just nine weeks with two supervised sessions per week and a deload scheduled in the middle. Now, in my opinion, I'm not sure that the deload was really necessary after having completed only eight training sessions, but perhaps they anticipated some excessive fatigue with one of the training modalities. That said, across 17 total sessions, participants performed two main exercises, the leg press and the leg extension. Each leg completed three sets per exercise with two minutes of rest between sets. The heavy leg worked in the three to five rep range while the light leg pushed out 20 to 25 reps. All sets were taken to failure and the working leg alternated each set to avoid fatigue bias. After every session, participants consumed a standard whey protein shake to ensure protein availability for recovery. Now, for the duration of the study period, participants were asked not to perform any other lower body exercise. They were, however, allowed to continue strength and endurance training for their upper bodies. Before and after the training program, the researchers measured maximal strength using one rep max testing on both exercises. They assessed muscle thickness via ultrasound at two sites along the vastus lateralis, and they collected muscle biopsies to analyze fiber type composition, fiber cross-sectional area, and cell cellular changes. This gave them both functional and fiber level insights into how the muscles respond to the two different training styles. Now, before we dive into the results, if you're ready to take your training to the next level, then head on over to my website and explore my full program library. I have evidence-based programs for all experience levels and preferences, whether you enjoy pure strength training, training for hypertrophy, or a hybrid approach and starting at just $12.99. If you're not sure which program is the best fit for you, please feel free to reach out as my team and I would be happy to help you choose. Now, let's get back to the results. 
So as expected, the low load condition, and this is the limb performing the higher rep ranges, performed much higher training volumes. On the leg press, participants lifted almost four times as much the total weight with the light load leg compared to the heavy load leg. And on the leg extension, about two and a half times more volume. But despite this, both conditions led to meaningful improvements. In terms of strength, the leg press one rep max increased by about 20% in both conditions, showing that heavy and light training were equally effective in this multi-joint movement. However, the leg extension strength told a slightly different story. The high load leg or the three to five rep condition improved by about 9%, while the low load leg actually declined slightly by around 3%. This suggests that for single joint movements, heavy training appeared to have an advantage, which is likely because of the task specificity and the neural demands of lifting the maximal load. For hypertrophy, ultrasound results revealed significant increases in muscle thickness at both measured sites. The mid-thigh site increased by about 7%, and since I always talk about muscle growth in terms of changes in muscle thickness, this was approximately 0.2 centimeters. And at the distal site, it increased by about 8%, which is around 0.1 centimeters. Most importantly, there were no differences between the high and low load conditions. So in nine weeks, it appears that both groups produced comparable muscle growth. However, when the researchers looked deeper at the muscle biopsies, they did not find measurable increases in fiber cross-sectional area or shifts in fiber type composition. Now, if I were to speculate here, this could be due to a number of reasons, including the relatively short nine week study duration with only 17 sessions performed in total, the variability in biopsy sampling or the rather small sample size. And when I say variability in biopsy sampling, I just mean that muscle biopsy only takes a tiny piece of the muscle. And since growth doesn't always happen evenly across the whole muscle, the exact spot that they sample can affect what they see under the microscope. At a cellular level, there were some interesting findings as well. Satellite cell content increased by about 25% in the type one muscle fibers, regardless of whether the leg was trained with heavy or light loads. Satellite cells in type two fibers, however, did not change. Now, I know there is someone listening who either isn't familiar with or needs a quick refresher on the types of muscle fibers. So to quickly recap, type one fibers, which are often called slow twitch fibers, are more fatigue resistant and built for endurance. They're typically smaller in size, they use oxygen more efficiently, and they are recruited during lighter loads or longer duration activities like steady state cardio, or in this case, higher rep resistance work. Type two fibers, also known as fast twitch fibers, are larger, more powerful, and generate force quickly, but they fatigue faster. These are the types of fibers that are primarily active during explosive, high intensity, or heavy load training. So to recap, the satellite cells in type two fibers was not different between the two conditions. Myonuclear number also remained stable with no increases across conditions. In fact, there was a slight decline in type two fibers, although the authors suggest this likely reflects natural variability rather than a meaningful negative training adaptation. So what do these findings mean for us in practice? Well, for hypertrophy, this study adds more evidence to the idea that both heavy and light loads can build muscle equally well, as long as the sets are taken close to failure. For strength, things get a little bit more nuanced. The multi-joint lift, specifically the leg press, improved equally in both conditions, while the single joint movement, the leg extension, still favored heavier loads. This differs somewhat from earlier studies exploring this topic. For example, Schoenfeld and colleagues in 2015 found that heavier training consistently produced superior strength gains, even when hypertrophy was similar. One possible explanation here is the novelty of the single leg leg press. Since participants weren't previously accustomed to training or testing this movement, both legs may have benefited of what's often referred to as a learning effect or neural adaptation, even though only one condition was actually lifting heavy. Looking at the muscle growth data, however, the increase in muscle thickness was fairly modest. One possibility is that the overall training stimulus just wasn't high enough to drive large changes in this group of trained lifters, especially at the muscle fiber level. After all, participants were only doing two exercises twice per week. For trained lifters, that's a relatively small amount of work, at least relative to my own training programs. So to me, it's not surprising that the hypertrophy response in this study was limited. 
Now, this point is especially relevant in the high load condition. With only three to five reps per set, the participants in this condition ended up performing just nine to 15 total reps per exercise. Even with two exercises, that's fewer than 30 reps per training session per leg. For individuals who are already resistance trained, that's not a lot of total work, and it may have limited the hypertrophy response we might expect from heavier training. On the other hand, the low load condition involved much higher rep counts, though we can't say for sure whether that translated into more stimulating reps close to failure. What we can say, however, is that despite the differences in load and rep range, both conditions led to similar modest increases in muscle thickness, while the changes at a fiber level were harder to detect. At the cellular level, the increase in satellite cells with type 1 fibers is actually very intriguing, as it challenges a common assumption about muscle fiber recruitment and growth, and that muscle fiber recruitment might be more flexible than previously thought. Just to rehash, type 2 slow twitch fibers are primarily endurance oriented and are thought to respond best to lighter, higher rep training. Yet in this study, even the high load, low rep group, which you'd typically expect to target mainly type 2 fibers, saw growth in type 1 fibers. Now, this suggests both training approaches expanded the potential for future muscle growth, even if it wasn't reflected in fiber size within this nine-week period. The fact that there were no changes in myonuclear number makes sense given the relatively small muscle growth overall. These participants were already trained, so it's possible that their muscles are closer to their adaptive ceiling, meaning their cells have less room left to grow and adapt. Think of it like the muscle's cellular machinery already running near full capacity. Overall, this study suggests that in trained individuals, both heavy and light loads taken to failure can produce comparable muscle growth, supporting the idea that there are many roads to roam when it comes to hypertrophy. Strength outcomes, however, depend more on the context. Regardless, those dealing with injuries, joint stress from aging, or those who simply dislike heavy lifting, this study provides encouraging evidence that low load training is still a viable and effective training option. While it's not a new or novel finding, it does provide additional evidence of the usefulness of low load training protocols. The takeaway to me is very clear. If your main goal is building muscle, you have flexibility. Choose the loads that suit your body, your equipment, and your personal preference, and just make sure that you're pushing close to failure. If you want to maximize strength, I would still recommend lifting heavier loads. And if heavy load training isn't practical for you right now, rest assured that low load training is not a wasted effort. Now, if you want to take a deeper dive into the science of muscle growth, check out my book, The Complete Exercise Guide to Muscle Hypertrophy. It's a graduate level resource perfect for coaches or fitness enthusiasts looking to broaden their knowledge on exercise science and muscle growth. The book features 13 in-depth chapters covering everything from natural limits of muscle growth, optimal training volume and muscle memory, to advanced training methods, sex differences, and so much more. It's available for just $59 and you can grab a copy today from my website. Well, everybody, that's all I have time for today. But if you found this breakdown helpful, please be sure to hit that like button, share and subscribe to my channel for more evidence-based training insights. And let me know in the comments, do you prefer heavy lifting, going lighter, for more reps or a mixture of both. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video.